Hopefully this is going to be a little bit of fun. Um, I'm sure we're all using extensions anyway, but I want to go through some of the uh, some of the extensions that I use. Um, what extensions are in case you don't know what they are, how you get them, where they're available from, all of those things. So if you uh, look down in the bottom left corner where it says meeting details, oh, the attachment didn't come through. All right, so in that case, it is, I just, I added it late to the, uh, to the calendar invite. Um, but here is just a document that I've been working on. It's, it is nothing beautiful, it is nothing fancy. But it's something that I thought potentially, uh, potentially you might wanna take a look at um, to, uh, to record some information or something. So uh, what are extensions? Extensions are essentially additions to the functionality of Google Chrome. I'll share my screen right now so you can see where they're at. I tried to zoom it up as much as I could so that you guys here, we're gonna lose the ability to see some of the text and everything, but hopefully this extension bar is a little bit bigger for you to take a look at up here. So the extensions are always found just to the right of your URL. It's actually called the Omnibar, uh, technically in, in Chrome, but you know the, uh, the web address bar right up here. Your extensions are all these guys in here. I will say right off the bat, the more extensions you add, the harder your machine has to work. Every time you add an extension, you're put, giving it a little bit of the memory, a little bit of the RAM. And so the more of them that you add up here, and I turned a ton of mine on just so you could see this, but generally I don't. Um, it does make your machine run a bit slower. And for those of you who think that you don't have any, you can actually hide them all by just making that address bar a little bit bigger. They're still there though. They're still hanging out. They're hidden over here. I hope that uh, I hope I can get them back. Or if I lost them, we might just have to go into here to find them. So, okay, so that's what extensions are. One thing to be aware of, and this I highlighted this one right off the bat because I've been dealing with this issue a little bit. This one has come up a lot with uh, text help and Equate IO and uh, Read and Write, Read and Write, and RyQ. Um, Extensions are based on the Google account that you're logged in with. But if you go into your Google account and you just log in from google.com, you're not actually doing that if you're on a PC or a Mac. You're not actually logging in with a Chrome profile. I don't have a, a PC or a Mac here, but what you'll find is up here, there's a little silhouette icon. And that tells you what extension you, or sorry, what profile you're logged in with. That profile is the one that extensions look to for permissions. So RyQ, anything from text help is based off the student's palser SD dot a, or sorry, prs26.ca email address. If it looks up there, even though the extension might be uh, installed and they have either not signed in with a profile or signed in with a personal Gmail profile, it's gonna say, you don't have permission to keep going. And what we're actually running across right now, I think with some of these, is students signed in because they said, oh, I wanna use Equate.io uh, online. Their 30 day trial is running out. That's because they don't have a profile logged in or they're logged in with a personal one, okay? So what we need to make sure first and foremost, when you're doing this, is that you're logged in with a PowerPoint proper profile. If you have any questions about this, stick around after. We can do some screen shares if you're on a Mac or a PC and we can take a look at that and I can help you out. The other nice thing that profiles do is it allows you to sync all of your data. So your history, your bookmarks, uh, your passwords, and your extensions will sync between your different devices. If you're using a Chromebook, by logging into that Chromebook, you are automatically connected with that Google profile. And so you are A-OK. -okay. There's nothing that you need to worry about. Uh, except if you have a personal Chromebook and you logged in with a Gmail account and now you're trying to use Palace or stuff on it, again, stick around and we can show you how to get around that. So where do you get extensions? You get them from the Chrome Web Store. The link's right here. If you go to the Chrome Web Store, I always find it by going to Chrome Web Store. You will also see down here, there's a Palace or Chrome Web Store. 
So we maintain a certain uh, number of apps and extensions that we recommend for different tasks. You, you may agree with them, you may not agree with them, but all of these ones that are in the Palace or Chrome web store are ones that we've taken a look at. We say, maybe this is a good one, right? Maybe this is one that you wanna take a look at using. Uh, they are also all available to our students. Okay, so I wanna go back here. They're all available to our students, so our students can also make use of all of those. There is only a list, and that list can be found here, of specific extensions that are available to our students. We do not let them have all of them. We started that in the fall of this year. We reduced them all. Part of the reason we did is because students were downloading theme changers or wallpaper changers, and they would have two or three of them in there, and they would conflict with each other, and sometimes they would break Chrome, and Chrome would just continue to crash, crash, crash on them. Okay, sometimes it worked great on a PC, but not so good on a Chromebook. So what we did is we said, we're gonna limit all those down. We're going to essentially blacklist all extensions for students. And now we maintain a whitelist. A, these are okay for them to install. So you can find that list there. If you need anything added on there, let me know. I'm gonna ask you if you looked at the privacy policy and everything, but you can definitely take a look there. All right, so here we go. Chrome extensions that I use. This is my first and foremost one that I think you should. I'm gonna come down to this one down here, which is One Click Extension Manager. I just installed this one the other day because I found this one, Simple EXT Manager, was one that I was using before and I've been using it for probably a couple of years now, but I didn't use all the functionality. One Click Extensions Manager is a simpler one. It's this guy right up here. It's the green circle with the purple puzzle piece on it. When you click on it, all it does is gives you a list of all of your extensions. Anything that is read is pushed out by uh, the, admin, uh, the admin panel. So you can't uninstall it or turn it off. Anything that's black is currently on. By clicking on it, it'll turn it off. Click on it again, it turns it back on. If there's any additional settings, you'll see the options here. So you can go to the options page. Down at the bottom, if you have a gray one, it means it's off, it's not available to you. So my number one thing that I would get if I were you is an extension manager. It allows you to turn them on and off as you need them. So all of these ones that might have something to do with a meet, I uh, generally leave those off the majority of the time and just turn them on when I need them. Number one thing to do, get an extension manager. Number two thing to do, and if you're not doing this, you need to re-examine what you're doing with your life, is get a password manager. Okay, I actually have two of them on here. Are they both active? I don't, I think only one is. This one is Keeper. This is the one that I use for uh, all of my Pal Palliser stuff. Our Palliser tech team subscribes to this so we can share passwords in here. The other one that I use, and this is my personal one, is, uh, and I'm gonna run out of space here. It's called LastPass. LastPass is one that I've been using for a long time for personal. I have it on my phone and everything like that. It keeps all my passwords in there. There is absolutely, uh, I don't even know half of my passwords because I'll create a 20 character, random character passwords. It is something crazy and I'll throw it in there. It allows me to do two factor authentication. The only password that I really need to remember, well, number one, I need to remember my Google one because I need to be able to log in. But number two, I need to remember my keeper password. It's super simple. You guys can see, I don't really mind if you see my vault here. Uh, we won't, we can do a whole nother thing on this guy, but essentially you log in. I have two factor authentication turned on and it lists all my passwords. So I can see all of my passwords there. If I go to a website and I am going to go to uh, PowerSchool. If I go to a website and it wants me to install one or sorry, it wants me to log in. You see how there's this little lock icon? I can click on that lock icon and click in my fill. It'll fill in my password and takes me straight in. So it's essentially one click. There are some times it doesn't work 100%. There are some times that it just doesn't work right. But the number of times, the number of different passwords I would say that I use is massive just because I can keep them all safe and secure with that. So number two, number one with uh, extensions is an extension manager. Number one for your life is a password uh, manager. Get one, okay? Let's keep going on. One that we get all the time is keep awake. So up here, 
We got the little cloud. Your Chromebook, I believe, shuts off. I think those guys, uh, sometimes we adjust it. It used to be 15 minutes. I believe it got extended to, I want to say 45, but I'm not 100% certain on that. I generally am touching my uh, keyboard every 15 minutes in, anyway, so it's not a big deal there. But this guy here will allow you to overcome the power saving on your computer. Now, please be aware that when you do some of this stuff, you are opening up a bit of a security hole. If you turn it on so your monitor never goes to sleep, it will never lock either. If it never locks at this time, it's probably not that big of a deal. But when you're in classrooms with the kids, it never locks and that will be open and available to them. Click on this guy and it says, what kind of power management do you want? Default screen awake. This means my screen never goes to sleep unless I lock it and system awake. This maintains my network connection. So it shuts down the screen. The screen will go to sleep, but the network connection is running in the background. So it's using a little bit of processing power. It's not quite hibernating like sometimes. So you can choose what it is. We'll go to screen awake. You see it changes to a little sunshine. And now we can continue on. So I know that that's a common one that people ask for is how do I overcome that? That's what I'm suggesting. It works on PCs. It works on Macs. It works on everything. All right. I'm going to pop up here. I'm trying to fire through as many of these as possible. And I know there's a few that we want. And actually, I'm going to do this while we're here. I am going to. Well, no, we'll come back to that and we'll show you that later. Um, Chrome remote desktop. I'm actually going to do a session on this and I am going to make a note of this one right now is Chrome remote desktop is this one right here. It looks like a little Chrome symbol with two windows behind it. What it allows you to do, it takes you to a website uh, and it gives you remote access or remote support. Remote access, if you have a computer that you always have running in on the background and you have Chrome open to it, you can have remote access. So you can remote into your work PC from home or you can remote into your home PC from work. I kind of leave that one alone. I sort of don't touch that one, but remote support is excellent. You can get support, in which case we're gonna generate a code. You guys are gonna see this and somebody out there is gonna try and get that. This code will expire in five minutes and it gives me a 12 digit code. That's the code that we would ask somebody to generate or we can give support, in which case they're going to give us that code. We're going to type it into there. We're going to click connect and it will connect us and give us or me control of their computer. So I just did this with a student the other day. They gave me support. I jumped on their computer and it was a little bit quicker for me to go through the settings and figure out what I wanted to do uh, than it was for them to go through it. But I'm also thinking that you could do this. If a student gave you support, you could jump onto their machine and uh, and start checking into it and, and seeing what's happening, maybe setting up a problem on there that you want them to work with, or you have a problem set up on your end on a on a application or something that you can't share across the cloud. You could give them access to your computer when you're all done, you hit stop sharing, just like you do with uh, stop presenting or anything like that, and it cuts off that connection. They cannot come in later and go, oh, I wanna jump back in on that connection. As long as you stop that sharing, they can't. So you set up a problem, give them access, they go in there and they do the problem and you can watch it. So a little bit of way of making non-interactive uh, applications interactive. So, all right, let's uh, scroll down here. Last one in the for use in the classroom, share the classroom. That's this guy right here. This is probably my number one tool, I would say, aside from Google Classroom. This is the first one I would install after Google Classroom. What this does, it doesn't matter where I am on the internet. It doesn't matter if I'm in a Google Doc sheet, slides, anything like that. If I'm on a website, as long as I'm connected and I click on that, it's gonna say, what do you wanna do? And I want to uh, I want to send this to my demo class. So I'm going to click on my demo class. And then it says, what do you want to do with that? 
So first thing I can do is I can push that extension. So those great big long URLs that we use bit shorteners or bitlies or whatever it is to, uh, to shorten sometimes. If our students have this extension installed, we can just push this directly to them and it will give you a little pop-up that says, you know, Mr. Kwasney wants you to open up this website. They have the exact website that we want them to do. So we're pushing it directly to them, nothing doing, right? So there we go, push to students. And because I'm dealing with a file here, I'm in a doc, it says, what do you want your students to be, do, to be able to do with this? So it's gonna adjust those sharing permissions for me. Maybe I don't wanna push, maybe I want to create an assignment with it. So I've spent all this time working in a Google doc or Google slides, creating a template. Now I wanna assign it to the students. I can either go and open up Google uh, Classroom, I can go in and, and that way, nothing wrong with that. But this one here allows me to go create assignment, it's gonna say, who do you wanna give it to? Same thing, exact same settings that we see when we're talking uh, in Google Classroom. I wanna give it to all students. I can give it a title, instructions. Here's my material. So I have that in there. I can click and check on it. I'm gonna pop back here. Oh, I probably lost it. Sorry, guys. I'm gonna create that assignment. Uh, And we're gonna come down here. There is a way, and I just have it probably zoomed in so much that I can't see it, but there is a way that we can say students can view, uh, students can edit or make a copy for each student. There is that inside of there. I'm just, uh, just because I'm zoomed in so much, I'm probably seeing it. Same thing, we can assign it to a category, we can assign it to a topic, points, give it a due date, all of the same bits. And then down at the bottom, we can assign it. Oh, sorry, up at the top. We can also do the same thing where we could just schedule it for later. Uh, it's, it's, it essentially gives you the same functionality as you have within Google Classroom. The only difference is now uh, we can also push links to our kids. So those are my, my top ones up there. Let's slide down a little bit farther. And for this, uh, I'm going to... Well, I'm gonna move my meet window over. So in here, and these are a few that people have asked me, I have meet attendance. I'll show you how we can do attendance. I'll show you how that works. So we're gonna bring that in in just a second. I did a really quick screen capture before we jumped on of the bar so you could know what the different buttons because this one is absolutely horrendous. It doesn't give any help text or anything like that. And I don't know what this last slider does. If anybody does, I would be happy to, if you let me know. Mute tab. Mute tab is the one that we talked about it for those who were here the other day when we talked about breakout sessions. I can mute a specific tab. So if I'm, again, I'm on this Chrome extension one, it's not making any noise, but if I wanna mute it, I could mute it. So when you're opening up and if I have a, another uh, Google Doc open, and this is what we found with, uh, with Chrome, if you right click on it, you can mute site, but that mutes all Google Docs or all Google Meets. So sometimes we want one Meet to be open and another Meet to be muted. This would allow us to do that one. So, so that's Mute tab, that's this guy right here. And then I also have Nod. So those of you who haven't seen Nod, I'm gonna bring it over, I'll show it to you. You can install it, but uh, you have to leave the Meet and then come back in in order for it to be active, so. So I'm gonna drag my, my meat over here. This is Nod up here. So what Nod does is just adds the, the ability to react to you and your students. So if you give it to your students and they think you're doing something good, they can come here and give you a thumbs up, and give you claps, whatever it is. If they wanna ask a question, they can raise their hand. One of the things with raising their hand Anybody in the meet can come over and they can clear that off. So anybody in the meet can turn it off. Um, so just so you're aware, it is not 100%. These are all third party developed. It is not locked in and super secure. Um, I, I mean, it is secure, but it is not embedded is the word I'm looking for within Chrome. It is an extension to Chrome and it is reliant on the developers and the uh, the um programmers out there so so sometimes they add stuff in sometimes they don't this is just the options to check for do we want to turn those off if the kids are going a little bit crazy and do i want to check for updates so this one relies on the students installing that as well you'll notice i don't have a grid view on here 
I turned grid view off because if you go into your options and your layout, Google has added that one. So I generally go with a tiled grid view. Uh, oops, I clicked on that one too quickly there. I, I leave mine on the tiled grid view because we have so many people in here, it switched to auto. Um, but because it's baked in now, I have more confidence that it's gonna work within Meet, the one that is natively in there, than using a third party. So I've moved to that. So um, right here, Meet attendance. You see, for those of you who have it installed, if you were on another Meet, you would have seen, or another, sorry, a web page, it would be gray. Now that I have that red apple, that tells me that it's ready. I'm in a meet. I can take attendance. To take attendance, I'm going to come down to the people tab. And uh, of course, it doesn't work. Let's zoom out a little bit here. I wonder if we're just zoomed in way too bit, way too much. Hmm. So this is an odd one because I just honestly had this one going. And it was down here and now it's not working for me. So uh, we'll have to see. I wonder, let me close this. Okay. Well, I apologize here, but uh, what you would see with meet um, attendance is another um, icon right inside here. And that icon is where you're gonna take your meet attendance and it actually opens up a spreadsheet that looks like this. And the spreadsheet allows you to take attendance of whoever is in your meet and timestamps it. So you can take for the same meet multiple times, multiple attendances. This is, I can see by the URL that these are different meets that I've done. And uh, you can take attendance at multiple points throughout that meet to see who was there and what was going on uh, essentially there. So it's an easy way to do that. All it does is put the names into there. It does not organize them by uh, alphabet or sorry, alphabetize them. It doesn't do that. It doesn't allow you to sort it. It doesn't export to power school. It doesn't do anything. It just grabs that in there and, and pulls the data into there. What I found is when you turn it on, if it was working, we click this one to create a spreadsheet. Once we have one spreadsheet, we should be good. And Generally, I found that whenever you click on the people tab, it opens up, a, or sorry, it uh, takes attendance. So it gives you another column of attendance every time you click on the people tab. So you can just keep going over there to do it. If it's not taking attendance, you wanna turn it off and turn it back on. This will also take attendance. And if that spreadsheet is not updating, you wanna take a look in your drive because it just goes into your main my drive. You can move it though. And it's down here just called meet attendance. And so it's frustrating that it didn't work for us. But we'll go with that and uh, and we'll just live with the outcome of, of that. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get it up and going. If you have questions with that one, it is fairly straightforward. It does work, uh, it does work not too, too bad. Um, I, aside from when it doesn't work like right now. I wonder if it's because I had another meet open. Do I have another meet open? I don't think I do. So regardless, there's a meet attendance allows you to get that really quick. Let's keep going though. Uh, mute tab we talked about, nod we talked about. All right, down here, I wanna pop into a couple of these ones really quickly. Number one is the open dyslexic font for Chrome. That's this guy right here. What it allows me to do 
is so i wish there was i shouldn't have went to news i should have went to something with with good news if you click on that and turn it on on any web page that you're on it used to work on google docs but when i tried it the other day it wasn't working on that it turns it to a open dyslexic a dyslexic font so it which actually is a little bit thicker it looks kind of boldish and it weights the bottom and supposedly, I am not dyslexic, so I can't comment on this, but supposedly this is supposed to uh, calm the eyes and focus the eyes for people with dyslexia. And it's supposed to make it easier to read. And I've heard a little bit of anecdotal uh, news on this that said, yes, it works. I can't comment on it specifically, um, but it can't hurt to allow our kids to do this. Uh, the other thing, if we print this page as a PDF, it's going to have this font on it. So. If it's something that maybe a student in our class would benefit from, you know, do it once, print it, do it and switch on the open dyslexic font, print it again or export it as a PDF. And now we have two copies. So um, and, and it didn't cost us really anything there. So I think that that one is pretty good. And again, it used to work in here. But. I think that Google probably updated some of their stuff and it doesn't work inside Chrome anymore or inside uh, Docs anymore, which is unfortunate. Uh, that's a good one. Um, let's come down. I have Color Pick Eyedropper. This one, if you're doing any type of design type stuff, you're making slides and you, you're a little OCD like me and you want to make sure that the color all matches, this one will be helpful. So I'm going to go into. Uh, Everybody loves a little Dennis Rodman. So we're going to go in here and we are going to turn on our color picker. And what you will see is it just gives us a little zoom and we can get right in on some of the colors with our little cross arrow. It zooms quite, quite, uh, quite good. It, it brings it in to, to a, quite a high level of zoom. And right in the middle is the color. And as I'm moving around, you'll see the two numbers that are changing. The top one is the hex number and the bottom one is the uh, RGB colors. But if we said we absolutely needed something that was the color of Dennis Rodman's hair, we could click on that and we can copy this color. And now when I go in here and I wanna change the color of my text, I'm going to go to custom and I can just drop that color in here and other serious extensions is now the color of Dennis Rodman's hair. So it's a, it's a really quick one and there's tons of them out there. I, this is one that I use. I generally try and grab ones that are a little bit lighter on um, memory. So I look for ones that are there. I definitely look at the privacy policies. I'm as, as guilty as anybody. I don't do that always. I get excited and sometimes I jump in, but I try and go back and look at the privacy policies because color pick eyedropper should not have any access to anything from me. And I want to make sure of that. So I look at those. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a simple one. It's a super simple one. I'm going to jump down to uBlock origin. Most people out there I think are running some type of blocker. If you're not, that's okay. You're uh, a lot of times I have this turned off. I choose uBlock Origin um, just because it was the one that was using the least amount of memory. I took a look at multiple ones. I took a look at what they asked for and what they offered. Essentially what it allows me to do is block any scripts that are running or block ads from popping up and things like that. Um, so this is one that I do. The 28 right there that you see that if we click on it will be 28 or 24% of requests have been blocked on this page. Uh, so, I mean, it's it has way more functionality than I use it for. Uh, and in fact, I a lot of times will have it turned off and I don't even bother. So now it doesn't even do anything to uh, Google Docs, which is how I, I should have had it set up anyway, but you can turn it on and off. So that's kind of a fun one. I have Mercury Reader here. What does Mercury Reader do? We're going to head back to our Dennis Rodman page. Uh, we are going to get rid of that. And Mercury Reader is this guy right here. If I click on it, it creates me a document that eliminates all of the extra stuff. So it gets rid of all the scripts. It gets rid of all of the side ads, 
all of the links, all of the comments at the bottom, everything is gone. And it just gives me my document. I'm gonna scroll up, so sorry if I made anybody seasick. I have dark mode turned on, but you can have light mode. You can make the font a little bit nicer. Um, I wonder if I, yeah, I didn't think it works with this one. So oh, we're gonna pull that back up there. It doesn't work with the open dyslexic font. Um, and we can have different text size, so we can set that up. Why would I do this? Well, I mean, we could send it to a Kindle, but you could print this off as a PDF. So if we go to print and save as PDF, now we can create a PDF copy of this that is clean. And by clean, I mean, it's not gonna have any of this stuff on the outside. And we know exactly what our kids are seeing, right? It also has where it came from. We're doing our job. We're doing our digital citizenship job here by, uh, by making sure um, we are uh, referencing, and I'm totally losing the proper word for it, but we're referencing where we got that from. So, and th the last one that I have, and this is just totally 100% for fun, uh, is my bit emoji. Um, I don't use it that much, but your bit emoji is just fun. So those of you who are wondering where you see people that have really cool stuff on there, uh, you can grab it and then we can, in this case, we have to copy it and paste it in there. And it's an easy way to add some some very quick uh, text or very quick images into this. The other nice thing that it does, and I hope I don't have any mail that you shouldn't see, is uh, in our mail. Oh, and I see it does, uh, for those of you who are watching here, it does uh, open dyslexic in here as well. Close the taskbar. I should have had this prep beforehand. But anyway, it gives you, when you compose an email, it gives you a little link down in the bottom. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it gives you a little link right by the send. Oh, there we go. Oh, and I clicked refresh. It gives you a little link right by the send that you can put a bitmoji into there too. So that one is just purely fun. There is, I would say there is absolutely nothing that, uh, that that adds aside from just a little bit of fun and a little bit of wittiness. So I am two minutes over, but I'm gonna stick around here. I will answer questions if you have. If anybody knows what that other slider does on uh, meet attendance, please let me know. Um, if anybody has any questions or suggestions for, uh, for future ones of these webinars that are pertinent to you guys, please let me know. I, I wanna make sure that you are getting, there we go. See my little bit emoji right there. So I won't put it in the two box, but um, and then obviously we're going to put the new hairstyles available now one in there because that's what everybody wants to see but let me know and I will help you out otherwise thanks for joining uh, today like I said stick around uh, hopefully tomorrow I'll get a three from the tech team out with uh, next week's are already up I'll get the week after I'm trying to jump two weeks ahead as I'm planning these um, but uh, yeah thanks and uh, take care I'm also going to stop my recording now here, so.